Welcome to the podcast today where we celebrate innovation for a happy planet. I am your host, Abigail Carroll. This week, we are speaking with Vincent Dumaisel, who called in from Climate Week in New York City. A French native from Burgundy, Vincent is a senior advisor to the United Nations Global Compact Program and director of the food program for Lloyd's Register Foundation. Vincent is also author of the new book titled The Seaweed Revolution, which I have now finished and can recommend as it's not only a great read, but it's full of information about the science and opportunities behind seaweed. But let's hear it from Vincent. So welcome to the podcast, Vincent. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. Well, thank you for taking time out this week. I know you're down at Climate Week in New York City. How's that going? Very well. A lot of uh, exciting news, a lot of enthusiasm around uh, the book and this uh, solution, uh, more importantly. So you've written a book called The Seaweed Revolution. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, the idea is to tell the world that there are still a lot of uh, solutions and a lot of uh, hopes. And I wanted to share that, uh, that seaweed is still vastly unknown and may well be the greatest untapped resource we have on the planet. It has the potential to address some of the biggest challenge we have in this generation and uh, being the father of three kids and uh, being tired of feeding them with uh, fears and drama, uh, I wanted to give them uh, and to the rest of uh, the next generation uh, some source of hopes and uh, being a bit positive and optimism. Why is this reason to give us hope? Because seaweed is a source of life on this planet. That uh, the first uh, complex organism existing uh, back a billion years ago were seaweed. And where then everything evolved from, uh, from there. If we want to repair the planet, uh, you have to start with the foundation. If you want to uh, rebuild your house, you're not going to start with the roof. You should start with the foundation. Same with our climate, with our life on the planet. We have to start with the foundation. So we have to pay attention to the foundation and enter into a new civilization, which is farming the ocean, which is trying to understand the the ocean and do not uh, consider the ocean as a landfill, which is what we are doing right now. So if we want to repair the ocean, which is once again, where we all come from, we need to start uh, with seaweed. Seaweed is uh, once again, greatest stunt up resource we have. So why do we need to repair the ocean? Well, uh, you know, everything we dump on land, it ends up in the ocean. And there, it destroys life. Uh, It destroys all the ecosystem. And an ocean is by far the the biggest ecosystem on the planet. The ocean is uh, 50% of the oxygen we breathe. So every second breath, we own it to the ocean. Uh, The ocean is 80% of the biodiversity on this planet. The ocean is 95% of the inhabitable place on this planet. And if you step back, this planet is blue. It's a blue planet. It's not the planet Earth, it's the planet Ocean. Yeah. And that's what it should be. And Ocean covers 71% of the planet. And still, it contributes to less than 2% of our food in calorie supply today. Mm. And it's crazy because there are still 1 billion people starving and uh, we don't use the ocean. So the whole idea is that we need to repair the ocean and we in the same time to repair our planet and to feed our fast growing population. And the only way to do it is to use the ocean and stop being uh, in an extractive mode only, be in a more regenerative mode with the ocean. I I come from the food industry uh, where we keep talking about regenerative uh, agriculture. And there cannot be any regenerative agriculture anywhere if you do not integrate the ocean in the equation. The ocean is a source of uh, regenerating everything. Oxygen, fresh water, uh, carbon, phosphate, uh, nitrogen, any nutrients. It all goes through the ocean to get recycled. And if we want to build a sustainable future on land, we have to understand better what happened in the past in the ocean. It's always hard to talk about seaweed. Uh, we should have said that before, but I mean, seaweed gathers 12,000 type of very different, different yes. organisms. Uh, I yeah. keep saying that there were, I mean, red and green uh, seaweed yeah. are and brown. 1.5 billion years old. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, and then they evolved over the last billion uh, years uh, into different organisms. Typically, the, the green seaweeds, they moved on land half a billion years ago only. And 
they gave birth to the entire vegetation we see around us. So wow. every tree and plant and, and, and fruit you see around you, they are descendant of green seaweed. And the funny thing is that today, a green seaweed that is on the beach will be way closer to an oak tree, a baobab or a strawberry than it is to a red seaweed from a genetic perspective. The wow. Gen the genetic difference between a red seaweed and a green seaweed is bigger than the difference between a fungi and an elephant. So we are talking about very different organisms. So when I'm asked, what can you do with seaweed? It's like, yeah. what can you do with the life on, 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 on land? On the earth, so it's, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. So you can do many things. They are very, very different. Their nutritional composition, of course, is very, very different. Some yeah. can be very rich in protein. Uh, we were talking about soy meal. Soy meal is 25% protein, soy. Uh, some seaweed, like uh, le, the nori that is wrapping our sushi or the palmaria palmata, the dulse, uh, they are 40% protein. So they are very rich in protein. Wow. Some will be richer in zinc, in iodine. But all of them, they are a nutritional bomb and they are, they are the healthiest food you can get. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's packed with critical nutrient, nutrients omega-3 long chain, yeah. uh, zinc, iodine, uh, that's the only vegetable that gets vitamin B12. Um, you, yeah, everything you need. And also seaweed is, uh, because it's not only a, a list of nutrients, it's also a, a, a cocktail effect. Seaweed is naturally antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, analgesic. So once again, it's good for your body and it's good for your planet. Yeah. So... We have all these different species. How have we decided the ones that we see the most? In the States, we see a lot of kelps. Will we start seeing more diversity in the types of seaweed available for us to eat? Or how, how's that going to work oh, out? Hopefully. Hopefully, yes. I mean, it's very strange. It's quite unique to the U.S. where seaweed equals kelp. So they... Right. <laughs> yes. It's, that's what grows here so easily, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite unique. Uh, because kelp is one type of brown seaweed. Yeah. We, we are talking about 12,000 type of seaweed. So yeah. the brown seaweeds, they are uh, 2,000. And not all of them are kelp. Huh? So it's a yeah. very minor part. Uh, in, yeah. ter in terms of volume, it's quite big compared to the other. But it's a minor part of uh, the seaweed. The red seaweeds, they are 8,000. And you have uh, more than 6,000 red seaweed and uh, 4,000 uh, green seaweed. So kelp is very uh, a, a small part of it. Kelp loves the cold uh, waters, and you've got quite a lot of cold waters in the U.S. That may be important. The, yeah. the, the tropical waters are, are a bit less important for your country. And also, we know how to cultivate them. Yeah, That's the critical thing. The problem yeah. to uh, develop this seaweed industry so far is that we don't know how to cultivate seaweed. We don't know how they reproduce. We don't know how they protect themselves. And that can be very complex, you know. Yeah. In some seaweed, in order to protect themselves, they will, if they are uh, attacked by a sea snail, for instance, they will be able to uh, release some toxin, which will warn the community and be, act as a repellent for the sea snails. Amazing. And all this complexity, because they are doing that with the help of the bacteria around them. All this complexity, we need to learn that. And not only how to seed them or to uh, reproduce them, we need to understand how they protect themselves or how they live in symbiosis with other organisms because we do not want to reproduce the same mistake as we did on land with monoculture, yeah, right. GMO, and industrial farming. We should yeah. develop a permaculture in the ocean. Yeah. So 97% of seaweed right now that we're consuming in every which way in the world is coming from Asia. But there seems to be a lot of interest in Europe and Africa and the Americas to start growing seaweed locally. What's going to be the tipping point to get those farms really productive? I think we are reaching the limit of our system right now on land. We see that uh, these food systems that we have developed are now the biggest contributor to climate change, to water scarcity, to biodiversity loss and somehow to social injustice, because a large part of the modern slaves on this world are uh, working in the food industry. So I think it's time for a different model. And we will have to produce way more than what we yep. do right now. There were some calculations from a, a European university that because of the growing demand for calories and because of the fast growing population, we will have to produce in the next 50 years or so as much food as we ever produce as human beings over the last 10,000 years. 
We cannot make it on land. The yields are stable for the last 20 years. There's no arable land left. Right, right. there's nothing left, yeah. So there's no way. I mean, we need to find new ways to cultivate uh, yeah. the world and notably the ocean if we want to do that. So once again, that's always this vision that drove me. And I think that's the tipping point that we have reached in the West, where if we want to feed the population, there's no other yeah. way than to use the, the ocean food. And once again, if we want to do it in a more than sustainable and regenerative way, then start with the lowest trophic level, the basis of the foundation of the chain, which is seaweed. Yeah. And do you think there are any unintended harmful consequences that could happen if we started massive farms off the coast of our continents? Is there something that, you know, we just can't, that might be hard to predict? Yes. Uh, I mean, just like everything, the question is not what we grow. The question is how we grow it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it all ends up to this question. So I... I simply hope that we have learned from experience from our mistakes online and that we will do a bit different and a bit better uh, in the ocean. Yeah. I would say uh, yes, but uh, but we know what, uh, what should not be done. We should not cultivate non-endemic non species. Yeah. Which is why it's so hard, because you can imagine that uh, if you are in Alaska and you want to start a seaweed farm, I mean, uh, agriculture on land, But you only know how to cultivate uh, goyava, banana, and rice. Right. You're right. not going to make it. And that's where we are with uh, seaweed. We only know how to cultivate the Asian species, but we should not move their cultivation here. Yeah. So we have to learn how to grow our own sea vegetables, our own sea crops. And that's the key here, and that's why it's going to be slow. But, uh, but I think we have no other choice, really. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about seaweed is a food source but seaweed has so many mother so many other applications yeah can you speak to some of those so yeah food is the obvious and the other there's a lot of uh, interesting effect besides the nutritional aspect when you dry seaweed you can keep them for many months without any need for any cold chain and it keeps all the nutrients this is which is rather good news yeah. for the emerging population and for our climate but Seaweed is good for your body, but it's not only good for your body. We mentioned that it's also good for the body of the animal. Yeah. So feeding animal with seaweed, and we have many examples of this in Europe, will uh, boost their immune system. And then you can cut the use of antibiotics. For some seaweed, it will reduce the methane emission. There's a small magic yeah. red seaweed, uh, which looks like uh, decreasing the methane emission by 90% by uh, livestock. So long story short, if you give... If you give 40 grams of this small red Australian seaweed to each and every cow on the planet, the impact on, on climate will be equivalent to stopping each and every car on the planet overnight. So we are not talking about something marginal. It's huge. Yeah. So let's try to feed animals with seaweed. That's the other thing. Seaweed, and that may be the most overlooked but uh, most interesting application, can be a source of biostimulant to replace fertilizers and chemicals uh, inputs. Yeah. And, and seaweed upcycle, naturally upcycle anything that comes into the ocean. So they will uh, absorb the nutrients, phosphate, nitrogen, and then you can use them on land in order to uh, uh, use these nutrients to protect our crops. And then you can substitute them to fertilizers. And more importantly, you can create a really circular agriculture where agriculture produces some waste that ends up in the ocean. Seaweed collects these nutrients, this pollution, upcycle it, and move it back to the land. Yeah. That's exactly where we want to go. But seaweed can also be a very interesting source of substitute to Harmful component. The most uh, important one we could think of is plastic. Plastic. I mean, the Hershot Prize, uh, there was a great meeting this week uh, here in New York with uh, Bill Gates and the Prince William and so forth. But, and, and one of the winners of the Hershot Prize is not Pla, and they are substituting oh, nice. plastic by seaweed, edible bubble of water, edible plastic uh, uh, packaging material, sorry, made out of seaweed. And by the way, they contribute to the... Uh, to the release of my book in English, The Sweet Revolution, and we had the first ever uh, book cover made from seaweed. Oh, excellent. So substitute this uh, unsustainable uh, packaging, notably plastic, by seaweed. That's very important. There are more than 35 startups over the world today that are doing this, Lollyware, Sway, yeah. uh, Kelpie in the US. 
they are uh, very active on uh, on that, and there's more and more on everything. You can substitute to cotton as well, textile, which is quite an unsustainable because cotton is two uh, percent of the arable land in the world, but twenty five percent of the pesticide, ten percent of the herbicides, and it needs a lot of water. So let's use seaweed instead. Once again, cotton is nothing but a descendant of green seaweed, so you can have the same properties in some of them. But more importantly, you can use seaweed to repair the ocean. Once again, and it's important to mention that because seaweed are disappearing. They are victim of climate change. They are victim of ecosystem disruption. There's a fire under the ocean and no one cares. And seaweed is a source of uh, all life on this planet. So if they disappear, the rest will disappear as well. And, and California, you lost 80% of the biggest seaweed forest in five years. Once again, we are all talking about the Amazon fire, but there's a fire in the ocean yeah. and no one cares. We need to protect, replant and cultivate seaweed, otherwise they will disappear and we will as well. Mm. Seaweed can be also a very good source of uh, carbon absorption and potentially carbon sequestration. Seaweed can decarbonize the economy on one hand, replacing plastic, uh, fertilizers, cutting methane emission, and it can also absorb carbon. Some seaweed, like the one you have in California, the giant kelp, they can grow up to 40 centimeters a day, up to 60 meters high. So it's growing very big and it absorbs a lot of carbon doing so. Yeah, yeah. And super sustainable. And uh, last but not least, because you don't do any revolution without tackling uh, social injustice. And uh, seaweed has a great potential to bring revenues and jobs to coastal community where the fishing resources will decline and disappear. That's for sure. Yes. And the interesting part of it is that in emerging countries, we can see that these revenues, these new revenues and, uh, and jobs, they are going mostly to women. So it contributes to further women empowerment and gender parity. In Zanzibar, where I was a few uh, weeks ago, 80% of the seaweed revenue, which are the second biggest export revenue in this island, are going to the women. And that has contributed to free the women from their uh, condition. It has many, many potential. Uh, yeah. There's many, many things you can do with seaweed. And the best is it, we have not mentioned the medicine as well, but medicine, there's an Alzheimer treatment that has been released in China, which looks very interesting. There's more and more cancer treatment based on seaweed. There's a lot of uh, treatment that, of medicine that are using seaweed already for uh, digestion and guts. So yes, yeah, there's, there's already many things in a, in, a, in France, a, a French and American team of doctors even managed to uh, restore the sight of a blind man using the protein that seaweed will use, algae will use to direct towards the light. So uh, once again, there's many, many things you can do with seaweed and we have only understood a very small part of them so far. We have to take a short break, but when we return, we'll hear how Vincent became interested in seaweed and what he believes it will take to jumpstart the seaweed market worldwide. A big thanks to the Maine Technology Institute, MTI, investing in innovation for a prosperous Maine. MTI is Maine's unique public-private partnership whose core mission is to diversify and grow Maine's economy by accelerating innovation in the state's targeted technology sectors. MTI offers grants, loans, equity investments, and services to support Maine entrepreneurs and organizations as they transform their innovative ideas into new products, services, and companies, leading to the creation of quality jobs for Maine people. For more information about MTI and its programs, please visit maintechnology.org. For a blue economy to thrive, people need to use more sustainable products. But which products? And will consumers actually adopt them? Innovators like you are hustling to figure this out. Spark number nine can tell you if there's demand for your product. Spark markets your product before it's built using online advertising so you launch smarter. Have a big idea? Vet it with Spark before you build. Visit Spark online at www.sparkno9.com or find them on LinkedIn. Maine Venture Fund is a state-sponsored venture fund here in Maine with a mission to support the highest potential Maine-based startup companies by investing early-stage capital. Maine Venture Fund's goal is to accelerate job growth and economic opportunity for the people of Maine. Learn more at mainventurefund.com. Welcome back to Happy Planet. My guest today is Vincent Dumezel. As you heard in the first half, Vincent has a lot of great reasons to be excited about seaweed. I asked him about his background and how he got started down this path. 
I started my career in Africa and I realized there what is world hunger. And that doesn't look good when you are not a teenager anymore, but yeah, like 20 something. That's quite traumatic, I think. And you want to find a solution. So I spent 20 years of my career working in the food systems, trying to make them better. And at the end of the day, I failed. And I feel like, I mean, we failed. We collectively failed. I mean, there's nothing we can do as long as we keep using only the land. Uh, once again, the yeah. land is 30% of our, our uh, surface area uh, yeah. planet. And we are overproducing uh, on land. In the meantime, we have 66 million square kilometers that are suitable for seaweed farming in the ocean. We are cultivating 2,000. <laughs> so it's just crazy. To me, it was obvious that if we want to feed uh, the next generation, we will have to use seaweed. And maybe because my, with my job, I had to travel a lot. So I realized what starvation means on one hand. And I also realized that some countries have found some solution in Asia, notably. So I was like, why not to implement then? And then it became obvious for many, notably at the UN where I'm working today. Uh, I mean, it was like uh, an awakening call for them, like it dawned on every one of us that, yeah, that's where the solution lies. I mean, one of the solutions, of course, it's not a silver bullet that will um, solve everything. I mean, it's always a convergence of solutions and there will be many other solutions. But that's a very, very interesting one because we need them. Yeah. So, you know, a revolution is started by big ideas, but then you have to have a certain number of steps in place to implement a revolution. So where are we now in this revolution and what do you think the next steps are that need to take place for us to really feel the wave? Yeah. So once again, first of all, there's a, a gap, a lack in terms of education uh, and training and science. So we need to improve science when it comes to the ocean, understand better what's happening there. I come from France, which is the second biggest maritime territory to the US. We have... 550 scientists in France working on two types of wheat that are very similar and we are cultivating this crop for 12,000 years. In the meantime, second biggest maritime territory, we have 70 scientists only compared yeah. to the 551 for crops. 70 scientists only working on 12,000 type of seaweed that we have started to study over the last 10 to 20 years. And I think yeah. we are way better than the U.S. <laughs> Wait, yeah, uh, yeah. Be with science. Well, that will change when you can make a baguette out of algae. We can. There's a very nice, uh, that's one of the key uh, challenges, a very nice uh, bread made from seaweed from sea and floor in the U.S. There's British, there's the U.S. company, you know, uh, and they do some bread out of seaweed with a lot of protein in there. So, yeah, you know, the change is coming. So that's the first thing. So raise science. Then we have also to put in place the right regulations. It's very hard to get a license to operate. It's easier to pump oil from the ocean than, than to grow the restorative seaweed. So we have to ease that regulation. We have to ease the food regulation as well. Uh, there are some crazy situations uh, on, uh, on the food safety regulation. So we have to ease that. And we have to get together as well, which is why we have formed the first ever global coalition of seaweed stakeholders, the Global Seaweed Coalition, that I am co-leading with some research uh, institute on the UN Global Compact. So we have for this coalition, which is gathering over 1,000 seaweed brands today. And we are organizing in EU in two weeks' time the first ever uh, EU summit organized by the European Commission on seaweed in order to raise awareness around this. So we need to act together. Fragmentation was a big issue in the seaweed industry so far. There's a lot of pioneers, of brave pioneers with great ideas, but they were working in isolation. We yeah. need to get together if we want this to change. And the last part, and the most important one, it lies with all of us. We are all the drivers of the change. Every day, each time we eat and we drink, we are environmental activists who can shape the world of tomorrow. Each time we eat and we drink, we can vote for seaweed, learn to cook them. I'm always told, wow, seaweed is full of umami, it's very strong, uh, it's not very good. There's 12,000 types of seaweeds. They are all edible, first of all. Uh, there's no toxic one. Hmm. Uh, and you need to cook them. You need to learn how to cook them. That's the key point. I mean, if you eat raw potatoes or raw... You get a tummy ache, actually, from... Yeah, you, you cannot even eat them, actually. I yeah, mean, they're actually toxic. I mean, they are <laughs> disgusting, yeah? And they are toxic raw potatoes. But if you eat uh, chips or chocolate, it's cool. The same with yeah. seaweed, you know? And the more you will use it, the more 
the market will grow, the more the demand will grow, the more it will be, the easier it will be for farmers to produce seaweed. I mean, there are a few farmers in the U.S., like very few. I mean, they, they have no market for them, and most of the seaweed uh, that is produced, I mean, we, we could not sell them if we produce more. So we need to get a market for seaweed. So once again, it lies with all of us. We are all actors of this change. Yeah, I've seen that a little bit. It's hard because you've got to get the sequence of events right because we don't want these ambitious farmers to go out and fail because they can't sell their their seaweed at the prices they need to sell it. Exactly. So it's a catch-22 to build these new economies. That's the problem, especially as, once again, the big issue we have is that when it comes to food, we we don't know how to farm the right seaweed. So typically... The nori uh, that you have in your sushi or the wakame, yeah. the wakame salad that you have in any Japanese restaurant, which is so popular. Yeah. We cannot farm it here. We cannot yeah. farm wakame because we don't have wakame and it's not an endemic species. We have some nori in the US and in Europe, but we don't know how to farm them. So most of the seaweed that we consume in the US, they are imported. And you don't want to just wild harvest either because then you're depriving the sea of its natural resources. Exactly. It needs to be done. It could be done. It doesn't need, but it could yeah. be done, but in a very controlled way. And yeah, you cannot really scale up uh, the production uh, in yeah. that aspect. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're a show about entrepreneurship. There are people listening that might be interested in creating startups in the seaweed world. Where's a good place to start today? What are some of the problems that need to be solved where there might be a market already in your mind? Should they go to food? Should they go to plastics? I think... Plastic will be a waste from uh, the civil production, basically, uh, if I can say so. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. We need to understand how to refine the seaweed or to bio-refine the seaweed. Yeah. Meaning, and at the end of the day, you will extract the food, the feed. Yeah. Uh, you will extract the biostimulant. You will uh, extract some interesting yeah. compound for cosmetics because the seaweed skin is very similar to our skin. So yeah. that's why every skincare has some seaweed in there. So we extract everything you need and maybe even the alginate and the carraginate and the agar-agar because that's something important to know that we are all eating seaweed every day in our daily life without even knowing it because uh, in any ice cream, in any dessert, in any bread, in any beer, in anything you have which is processed, you have seaweed which is uh, the biggest gelling agent or texturing agent. Once again, carraginate, agar-agar and and alginate. So once you have extracted all of this from the seaweed, there's a waste, and that will be the biopackaging. Uh, that will be the substitute to the plastic. Got That's it. what makes it cost-effective. Because yeah. if you cultivate seaweed just for packaging production, yeah. then it might be very expensive. And that's something we need to learn as well. Typically, uh, uh, the supply chain has to be built. We need to uh, educate people. We need to train a new generation of scientists. If you are in the U.S. and you want to become seaweed farmer, I doubt there's any training and education or courses to do that, you know. So, uh, so you need you need to bring that to life, but you need also to learn how to extract these various compounds, and we don't know that yet very yeah. well. I think the biostimulant part will be the most urgent part. If you look at phosphate, for instance, we are relying on phosphate production from North Africa, so we right now and a bit in China and and a lot in uh, in, uh, in in Russia, but mostly in North Africa. Uh, we know that this mining extraction will end at some point. And, uh, and the Guardian, uh, uh, the journal in the UK, wrote a very good article about the phosphagedon. The fact that the phosphate prices will go higher and yeah. higher and higher. And at some point, there will be no phosphate left in the mines. And there will be a big famine in this world. Because without phosphate, there's no uh, agriculture at all. Yeah. And in the meantime, China, there will be no troll in phosphate in five years from now, using seaweed to recycle and upcycle the phosphate that ends up in the ocean. And we are buying the phosphate more. And so I think that, uh, once again, using seaweed to support our agriculture will be a very, yeah. very interesting solution in the next years. Yeah. But everything, I mean, and it's good to rely on many different applications because there's many different seaweed and because it will make this industry more resilient, yeah. which is good. But I think if I had um, some advice for some entrepreneurs that are listening, and uh, I mean, we created this coalition for them. So it's a free coalition. Once again, I have nothing to sell. You know, yeah. it's a UN coalition. It's a global seaweed coalition.org. You can become a member and then you get all the information. You have a clear mapping of who is doing what and where and where you can do what uh, and so forth and decide where where you want to position uh, your industry into that. And uh, 
I think in the US, you have a huge potential. Once again, the biggest marine territory in the yeah. world, some very interesting cold water, and there's a lot of projects uh, popping up in Alaska, notably. And I think that's very, very smart because that's, uh, with the climate change, more and more uh, of this area will be de-iced and, uh, and they will be yeah. suitable for seaweed cultivation. Can you farm seaweed offshore? Like a lot of the farm fishing happens on close to shore, but we're talking more, more about trying to get a license program together so that you can start to farm fish beyond the coastal waters. Well, first of all, we need to farm fish and seaweed together. Uh, we need to stop farming fish alone because yeah. nothing grows in isolation in nature. We have to yeah. remember this. Yeah. Uh, and mimicking the nature is the best thing we can do. So we have to farm them together. That's one thing. And also you can, in certain conditions, farm offshore. The biggest and the most uh, inspiring project we have in terms of farming uh, seaweed right now is off Namibia in a big upwelling area, which is an area where the nutrients are moving mm. from the bottom of the uh, abyssal sediment to the surface. And then... If you put ropes there, you will have a lot of seaweed. Because seaweed, they need light and they need sediment. And most likely these sediment, they come from the soil. So you cannot normally grow them in offshore conditions yeah. unless you have specific conditions uh, such as this one. Yeah. And here we are talking about 70,000 70, square kilometers. So it's quite a large area. And there are a lot of upwelling around the world. Uh, you, you could think of... Uh, of growing seaweed in very polluted areas as well, which we could be a very good way to depollute this area. I'm here in touch with the Shinnecock uh, Nation here in the US, in the Long Island region, which are using their traditional knowledge around seaweed to depollute this area, which should be interesting as well. So, yeah, I mean, you can use seaweed uh, uh, along with offshore wind farms. That could be very smart to pour, put ropes in between offshore wind farms to create both energy and seaweed. Yeah. But there is obviously some uh, um, some zone in the ocean where you cannot grow seaweed. Yeah, it's too deep or you can't anchor it. Yeah. yeah. So there's there, we need a lot yeah. of creativity. Yeah. So I ask everybody who comes on this show, are you optimistic about our future and our ability to stay ahead of climate pressures? I'm more and more optimistic about uh, our future. And I'm very, very optimistic. First of all, because I think we need to. If we want to win a fight, you have right. to believe that you can yeah. win it. Otherwise, you will never make it. I'm into sports and you don't uh, enter into a game thinking you may lose it because you will lose for sure. So we are at war right now and, and we should win this fight and, and we will. And I'm also optimistic because being a bit provocative, but once again, out of all my travels, there's factually, there's nothing that can uh, you cannot deny this. The world is getting better and better. Starvation has declined yeah, from yeah, sure. 80% to 9% in, in less than a century. Education has, I mean, has never been that high. It was 20% 60 years ago. We are talking about 80% of educated people now. Uh, the gender parity, even if there is still a lot to be done, it has never been that good. We have eradicated most of the worst disease on this planet over the last century. So the world is getting better. We are on the right trend. Uh, we need, it doesn't mean that the world is doing good. I mean, there's still a lot to be done. We need to keep fighting, but we are on the right trend, I think. And, and the next generation will make it much better. And I think that the next generation will not be the COVID generation. It will not be the climate change generation. I think the next generation will be the first generation on this planet that will be able, by cultivating notably the ocean, will be able to feed the entire population of this world while mitigating climate change, while restoring biodiversity and alleviating poverty, they will be remembered as such. But they will need all of us. And this revolution needs to start today. Yeah. I'm going to have a great afternoon. You've just you've put me in a wonderful mood. I have learned so much today. And, um, and I'm not new to this. There is a lot to learn. It's just it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time today. Thank you, Vincent, for joining us today and sharing your deep knowledge about everything seaweed. You can find links to Vincent, his book, and his organization, the Global Seaweed Coalition, in our show notes. Thank you once again for listening. Please follow Happy Planet wherever you tune in and leave us a rating and review. It really helps new listeners discover the show. Happy Planet was reported and hosted by me, Abigail Carroll. I am also the executive producer. 
The talented Matt Patterson is our producer and editor. Composer George Brandel Egloff created our theme music. Learn more about my work and get in touch by visiting happyplanetpodcast.com.